Okay, I guess we can start. So again, welcome to today's central exercise session in Mathematics 2. Um, as I just said, please post your questions to the chat channel. So we have a chat channel here on chat.tum.te. And please use this channel here, MA9714-CE for any questions to the central exercise session here. We we'll try to answer the questions uh, live on air. Um, we have a moderator on the chat channel. Today's moderator is Philip Capes. He will be either answering your questions or redirecting them to me. Philip, uh, would you introduce yourself, please? Um, hey, uh, I'm Philip. I'm a master's student and I'm yeah today's uh, moderator. Okay, thanks a lot. So let's start with uh, today's problem session here. We discuss sheet number five today. And as usual, I'll take a quick break after every problem and sub-problem to see whether you have any questions. Uh, before we start, um, as usual, a quick survey on the home study problems on that sheet. So again, I'd like to see which of these were especially difficult for you, or maybe none of these were, were difficult for you, we'll see. So I have prepared a small poll, and I'd like to ask you to fill in that poll. give you a minute to do that okay and i'll end the poll now and see if i can publish results you should now see the results so uh, computing a jacobi matrix does not seem to be that difficult uh, as was i was expecting um determination of directional derivatives seems to be complicated unfortunately i remember we had this last week as well I was hoping it would become easier with uh, the lectures of last week. Apparently it didn't, so maybe we can um, we can demonstrate a quick example on that later on. Uh, if I if I don't uh, do that, Philip, then please just remind me at the end. Um, and also application of chain rule and or product rule. We will have examples of that in the central exercise problem. So hopefully I'll um, have time to explain these. Okay, so let's start with the problem sheet then. Um, I just start at the very beginning with the determination of uh, two Jacobi matrices. As I said, that shouldn't be too complicated for most of you, but still might not be a bad idea to recap that briefly. Uh, before we go to 5.5 five, and in 5.5, five, five, we'll see the chain rule and we can also make an example of product rule as part of that problem. Okay, so let's start at C45. Determine the Jacobi matrix of the following functions. Um, A, we have a function F defined on R2 uh, mapping to R3. And the definition of that function is F of x1, x2 equals x1 x2 squared, x1 squared x2, and x1 squared plus x2 squared. Okay, so you can see the function takes two input parameters, x1 and x2, and it outputs a vector in R3, three-dimensional output. Okay, so what does that mean for the Jacobi matrix? Well, what we have to do basically is to differentiate each of the rows of this output vector separately with respect to each of the input variables. So the Jacobi matrix gets one row for each row of the output. So we'll have a Jacobi matrix that has three rows and it gets one column per input vari variable. So we get two columns going to be a three by two matrix. So the first row, we get that by simply differentiating this first row here with respect to x1 and then with respect to x2, okay? So if we differentiate that with respect to x1, um, what we get is simply x2 squared. And if we differentiate that with respect to x2, then we get 2x1, x2. Okay, so 
this first column here that is the partial derivatives with respect to x1 and the second column that is the partial derivatives with respect to x2. Okay, let's do this for the other columns as well. So this one here, if we differentiate the green row with respect to x1, then we get 2x1, x2. And differentiating with respect to x2 simply yields x1 squared. And finally, this last row here, differentiating that with respect to x1 will give us 2x1. And with respect to x2, that yields 2x2. Okay, so that should hopefully be pretty straightforward. That's the Jacobi matrix of this first function f here. Do we already have any questions, Philip? No, not for the... No, okay, not so far. Good, so let's uh, go to the second one straight away. So for point B, this time we have a function from... Um, I think you have a problem with your mic. I have a problem with my microphone, let me just put... I'll put back in, let's see. Second. No, it's, it's good. Settings. Is it good again? Yeah, no, it's good again. Okay, thanks. It's very, very quiet. Well, that seems to happen sometimes. Okay. Okay, let's get back to that problem. So part B, R3, 2 R3. Um, so we have this time not two, but three input variables, x1, x2, x3. And again, a three-dimensional output. And that is e to the x1 e to the x1 plus x2 and e to the x1 plus x2 plus x3. And again, the task is to compute the Jacobi matrix of that function. So Jf of x1, x2, x3. And again, we just differentiate each row with respect to each of the three variables. So this time we will get, um, sorry, we will get three rows again and three columns, one for each of these variables. Okay, so differentiating um, the first row with respect to um, x1. So again, use colors for that. That is of course just e to the x1. Then differentiating that with respect to x2, we get zero and with respect to x3, we again get zero. Second row is going to be similar. If you differentiate that with respect to x1, then we just get that term again, e to the x1 plus x2. Same thing happens if we differentiate with respect to x2. And there's no x3 in that term, so differentiating with respect to x3 just yields zero. And finally, for the last row, well, differentiating with respect to x1 just yields that term once more. So we get e to the x1 plus x2 plus x3. And the same thing happens if we differentiate for x2 and also for x3 this time. Okay, so that's the Jacobi matrix um, of that function. Okay, that completes the first problem here. That uh, was an easy warm up, hopefully. Any questions? No, it should be clear. It should be clear. I hope so. <laughs> okay, thank you. So let's uh, try the next problem then. <clears throat> that may hopefully be a little more interesting. So C55, that's where we are going to see the chain rule and we can also extend that to see the product rule. 
Uh, we have two functions. The functions are f. That's a function on three variables that produces real values. And f is defined as f of x1, x2, x3 is equal to x1 squared e to the x2, x3. And then we have g. That's a function on R2 that produces outputs in R3. And g of x1, x2 is defined as, let's see, 2x1 plus x2, x1 minus x2, and x1. And the first task is simply to compute uh, the derivatives of f and g respectively. So f uh, is a real valued function. That means the derivative df at x is simply uh, the gradient of f at x transposed. So for the gradient, um, what we get is, well, differentiating that with respect to um, x1 yields 2x1, and this e term just stays. Differentiating with respect to uh, x2 yields, well, that x1 squared is regarded as a constant, so that stays as it is. Um, then we get this e to the x2, x3. And now we need to apply chain rule, um, the usual one dimensional chain rule. So we need to differentiate this expression here with respect to x2 that yields an x3. So we get this times x3. And I'm writing it in front of the e2 to, to make this a little more clear. Okay, and finally, differentiating with respect to um, x3, that's almost the same thing. We get x1 squared, um, again, e to the x2, x3. And again, we have to differentiate this expression here, x2, x3, with respect to x3. So that gives us x2, again, using chain rule. Okay, so that's the gradient and we have to transpose it to get the derivative. Okay, for G, um, things are similar. So for G, we compute the Jacobi matrix. Um, and we simply start with the first row, that's two X1 plus X2. You can see that here. Differentiating that with respect to X1 yields two, and with respect to x2, we just get one. Then for the second row, um, we get one, differentiating with respect to x1, and for x2, we get minus one. And for the last row, we get a one in the x1 position, and it doesn't contain x2, so that's a zero here in that column. Okay, so that's the two first derivatives um, of those two functions. And in part B, we are now going to apply the chain rule to get uh, the derivative of the combined function f after g. Before we do that, let's uh, again see if there are any questions. Um, there was a question um, that you please reiterate the values of the first part in 5.5a. The first part? Yeah. So the, the df? the df part, um, just how you got the values. Okay, yeah, so let me let me try to explain that one again. Um, here's f, that's our function definition and we have to differentiate that with respect to x1, x2 and x3 to get the gradient, okay? If we differentiate with respect to x1 and well, there's no x1 in this part of the expression. So with respect to x1, that it would be a constant. That just stays as it is, yeah? So that's the part that we have to actually apply differentiation on. And well, 
x1 squared differentiated is 2x1. So we get 2x1 times this e expression. That's probably the easier of, of the two, of the three. Okay, so if we differentiate with respect to x2, things get a little more complicated. Um, what happens then is this first part here doesn't contain an x2. So as far as x2 is concerned, this is a constant. So it just stays as it is, yeah? That, that's the expression we get here, x1, x1 squared. And then we have this, e to the x2, x3. Let's differentiate that. So if we compute the partial derivative of that function, e to the x2, oh, sorry, x3. So that's x2 times x3 here with respect to x2. Well, again, the x3 is a constant because we're only regarding x2 as variable here. Yeah, we're only differentiating with respect to x2. So what happens is we have something like e to the constant times x2. And if we differentiate that, then this e term reproduces first. So we get e to the x2, x3. And then we have to apply chain rule in one dimension. And that means we have to differentiate that expression and multiply by the derivative of that expression. So this needs to be multiplied by d of x2, x3, again with respect to x2. And that means what we get here, well, this derivative here, that is simply x3. Oops. Yeah, so that's the outcome of that operation here. And together with this x1 squared, we have x1 squared times x3, that is this one here, times the e expression, this one here. Yeah, so that's how the second row is computed. And the third row works just the same. Um, only the roles of x2 and x3 are now interchanged, yeah? So this differentiation here with respect to x3, that would then yield x2 instead of x3. And that's what's happens here. Yeah, that there's an x2, otherwise things are the same. I hope that did answer your question. Uh, if not, then please just write another message to the chat. Um, another question is um, why we calculate the derivatives of G and um, F of the two functions differently? Uh, why do we calculate the derivatives different? Well, the answer is uh, we don't actually. So what we do is, um, let me illustrate that with the F. So what we do with this, with this G here, um, we take each row, on its own. And then we differentiate with respect to each of the variables. Um, that gives us again, three rows, one for each of these functions here and one column per variable. So if we differentiate G, what happens is, well, the first row, this one here, differentiated with respect to X1, that's a two. And with respect to X2, that's a one and the same principle for rows two and also rows three. Um, for the function f, let me write this down once more. So if we take the function f here, uh, that was defined as f of x1, x2, x3 is x1 squared e to the x2, x3. Now, if we want to differentiate that, means we're taking df at x or the Jacobi matrix of f if you want, same thing. Um, and we can do the very same thing. We have one row here. So the output should consist of one row and we have three variables. So the output should consist of three columns. Okay, so what we can do is um, let's start by differentiating this one row with respect to the first variable. Then we get 2x1 e to the x2, x3. Then with respect to the second variable, we get x1 squared 
x3 e to the x2 x3. And with respect to the third variable, x1 squared, x2 e to the x2 x3. We've computed those already. Okay, so that's the outcome. That's the, the differential of f. And as you know, the differential of f is the same thing as the gradient of f, basically. The only difference is more of a technical nature. Um, the differential is a line, whereas the gradient is a column. So you'd have to um, transpose the gradient to get the differential. Which one you prefer is, in this case, um, mostly a matter of taste, whether you rather write line or a column and then transpose it or not. Uh, this will become important once we apply chain rule or product rule, yeah? Because uh, whether you have a column or a row and the order of the two derivatives is unimportant because we're talking about matrix products and you know very well in matrix products, the factors are not interchangeable. So the order is important and whether you have a column or a row is also important. Um, and that's why we need to pay attention to that in this case. So usually for the, uh, for the chain rule and the product rule, you, were working, you would work with differentials because that's more universal. Um, but if you have just a real valued function, it's only a matter of taste whether you'd like to write a row or a column. Okay, I hope that answers this question. If that was not what you meant, again, just post another message to the chat. And this was the last question. Okay, so let's go on with uh, part B then. See if we got any more questions. Um, so in part B, we'd like to compute the differential of f after g of x. Let's first have a look at that function here, f after g. Um, so that means we take an input, we first apply g to that input, and then we apply f to the result. Yeah, so this input, well, g takes an input from R2. So what happens here is we take an input from R2, um, we take it into g, um, and then we get something in R3. G produces a three-dimensional vector. And then we can apply f on that and get a result in R. So altogether, that function takes two variables as input and produces a real number as output. Okay, so to take to to uh, compute the differential of that one, um, we can now just apply chain rule. The differential of this f of g, so this one here, um, what will that be? Well, again, what we have is a function that takes an input from R2 and produces an output in R. So we just have one row in our function. And that means the differential will be a matrix with one row and as many columns as input variables, so two. So it's going to be a one by two vector. Yeah, a row vector with two entries. So how do we compute that using chain rule? Well, just apply the formula. So this differential of f of g of x by chain rule, what you do is basically the same thing that you're used to from one dimensional analysis. You first take the differential of the outer function df and you evaluate that at the position g of x at that point here. And then you multiply that with the differential of the inner function, which is g. So you multiply with dg of x. Um, in one dimensional theory, both of these parts here, this part and also this part, those were both real valued functions. So in effect, um, you would multiply two real numbers. And the order of that does not really matter. Um, that is different now because both of these differentials are now matrices. So d 
depending on the dimension of these matrices, the order might matter. Um, and even if, if both is possible, even if uh, you can either have this order or the opposite order, then the result will generally not be the same. Okay, so it's important to pay attention to the order of the product now. Otherwise, the rule looks just the same as in dimension one. Okay, um, let's see. So remember DF, we had DF somewhere up there. Uh, let's take this one here. So DF, that looked like this. And the only thing we have to do here now is um, instead of the X's here, we have to use the output of the function G. So let's copy that over. So it's a little easier to fill it in. Uh, copy. Let's copy that here. Yeah, so that's just as a reminder, that was DF of X that looked like this. And uh, now we're going to apply that. So we need df of g of x. So what we get here is, um, 2x1 times e to the x2, x3. x1 means the first line of g of x. So g of x, so much beginning is here. So that first component of g of x, it looks like this here. Okay, so that's what we need to put instead of x1. This is what we need to put instead of x2. And this is what we need to put instead of x3, the third component of g or the second component of g respectively. Okay, so what we get is two times that first component. Again, that first component is two x1 plus x2 times e to the x2, x3. Um, that means the second and the third component of g of x. So that is e to the x1 minus x2 times x1. That's the first component of df of x. The second component, um, x1 squared, x3. So again, x1 means the first component of g of x1, x2. Um, so we get 2x1 plus x2, that's this first component, squared, times the third component is x1, and we've already had that e expression here, that stays the same. And finally, hope I can fit that on that line, again the first component of g of x squared times x2, x2 is the second component of G, which is X1 minus X2, and times E to the X1 minus X2 times X1 almost. I hope you can still read that. Okay, so that's DF of G of X. And we need to multiply this um, by DG of X. Oh, we know dg of x already. We computed that before. Uh, where do we have that? Here, yeah. So this Jacobi matrix, that is dg of x. Okay, so that's just this matrix here. It's a little easier. Um, two, one, one, minus one, one, zero. Okay. So what we have here is um, the first component of our product is a matrix with one row and three columns. So that is in our one by three. And here's a matrix that is in our three by two, two rows, uh, sorry, three rows, two columns. Okay. so. So this matrix product is actually defined and that's the first thing I should check if you write this down. If, if the result is not even defined, then you probably made an, a mistake somewhere. Yeah, and it is defined if that middle um, dimension here, that, that has to agree. 
And the result will then be a matrix with one row. First matrix determines the number of rows and two columns. Second matrix determines the number of columns. Okay, so let's just compute that result. And what we get here is, well, one row um, and two columns. See if I can fit that on maybe two lines. Um, we get the first uh, column by, um, by multiplying the row matrix with the first column of that second matrix here. Yeah, so we multiply this and this as a scalar product, yeah, row times column. So that's going to be the first uh, entry of our resulting matrix. Um, you can see that all of these here have at least this E factor here in common. Yeah, that, that appears everywhere. So we can just take that out of the matrix. Let's do that to make things a little more um, clear, okay? So we have this e to the x1 minus x2 times x1, that's everywhere in all the components. So we can just factor that out. And then we are left with, let's see, um, two times the first entry plus one times the second plus one time the third. So we are getting uh, two times two times, this is the first entry, this two times, that means we have a four inside of a two now, two x one plus x two. We factored out that E expression already, so we don't have to care about that. Plus one time the second entry, so that's two x one plus x two squared x one. And also one time the third entry, that is two x one plus x two squared x one minus x two, okay? So that's the first column of our resulting matrix. Um, and I have to write the second column in the next line because my sheet doesn't extend as far to the right as necessary. So the second column is computed by multiplying the row with this column vector now. So one times the first entry minus one times the second entry and zero times the last one. So what we get here is then uh, two times two x1 plus x2, that e is factored out, minus two x1 plus x2 squared x1. Okay. And to make this uh, a little nicer, maybe it would be advisable to write this as a column transposed instead of as a row. So let's try to do that. So we have this E factored out here. Uh, if you look a little closely at that, then you can see that this factor two X one plus X two that also happens to appear in every component here. So we can also factor that one out. So times two X one plus X two times, and what remains here is um, what remains is a four plus two X one plus X two. We only factored out one of these X one plus two X one plus X two X one minus X two. And in the second column or now the second row of the transpose vector, we get two minus two X one plus X two X one. And we have to transpose this now to get back to the row that we want. Okay, I think uh, more simplification doesn't make that much sense. Um, it doesn't get a lot of better than that. So that is a uh, chain rule. What questions are there so far? Um, there's one question if you can explain um, the first part of the, how you started with the um, F, G, X, as is a, the combination part. So, so this D, F of G of X. Yes. Okay, I'll Maybe try that. Too fast. Maybe it was too fast, yeah. 
Okay, uh, let's get back to that one. Um, so once more, let me just copy this and maybe I can explain one component and then it totally becomes clearer. So we want this one here. So this is DF uh, and we want DF of G. Just a second. Um, and remember G of X1, X2, G of X, uh, that was, let me scroll back just a little, that was two X1 plus X2, X1 minus X2 and X1, okay? Um, and to make things a little more clear, what we actually want to do is now we want DF of G of X. Um, so maybe it's a good idea to give this G of X a new name to differentiate that clearly. Let's call this Y. Okay, so Y is a vector in R3. Y1, Y2, Y3. Okay, what we want to do now is um, we want to substitute the result of G of X, so this Y, we want to substitute that into DF. So what we want to compute is actually df of g of x or df of y or df of y1, y2, y3. Well, this here is df. Yeah, then clearly if we substitute y1, y2, y3 instead of x1, x2, x3, then what we get is 2y1, e to the y2, y3, y1 squared, y3, e to the y2, y3, and y1 squared, y2, e to the y2, y3. Okay? And now all we need to do is, um, instead of writing y1, y2, y3, we use the actual expressions here. Um, and those come from this definition of g. So we know that y1 is actually the same thing as 2x1 plus x2. y2 is the same thing as x1 minus x2. And y3 is the same thing as x1. So we just exchange y1, y2, y3 by these expressions. And then we get, well, 2y1, um, should have used different colors here actually. Let me write that one again. So uh, y1, let's use orange for that. That's 2x1 plus x2. y2, we use green here, that's x1 minus x2. And the blue one, that's x1. Okay, so we have 2y1. y1 is the same as 2x1 plus x2. So we put that instead of y1. Um, and then we have e to the power of y2, y3. y2 is x1 minus x2. That's y2 here. And uh, y3 is x1. Okay. And that's the first component. And the same thing happens with the second and the third component. Um, I'll write those in new lines to be a little more clear here. So for the uh, second component, we have y1 squared. Again, y1 is 2x1 plus x2 squared. Um, yeah, should write the squared in, in white actually, uh, times y3. Y3 is X1 times E to the power of Y2, Y3. Y2 is X1 minus X2. Y3 is X1. And last but not least, the third component. Um, again, we have Y1 squared. So that's two X1 plus X2 squared times y2, y2 is the green one, x1 minus x2, and e to the power of y2, y3. 
So that's e to the x1 minus x2 times y3, that's x1. Okay, and remember that is a, is a row here. So we have a one by three matrix here. I just wrote it on different lines to uh, make the distinction a little clearer. Okay, I hope that answers this question. Did that clarify things? I think so. There's no no further question about that. Um, just one more. Um, I think not everyone is clear uh, what's the difference between the Jacobi matrix, the gradient, and the transpose uh, gradient, and when to use each of these? Okay, so to make this um, a little more clear, the differences between Jacobi matrix, gradient, transpose gradient, and so on, um, that's actually not, not very difficult. Um, basically, the gradient is the only exception to the general rules, yeah? So what we have is, this differential of a function f at a point, um, that's the most general term that we have. And we often, or we could often write this as f prime of x. Um, I'm usually not doing this to avoid confusion with one dimensional um, derivatives, but that's not that unusual. Um, so what this means is you take every component of the function as a row, you differentiate each row by each of the variables, and then you get one row per function component, one column per variable. Okay, so that is generally a matrix that looks like this. One row per function component and one column per, let's say per input variable. Yeah, so the rows kind of relate to the output and the columns relate to the input if you want. Okay, so this is exactly the same thing as the Jacobi matrix. Yeah, that's generally the same. And as I said, the gradient is an exception to this general rule, mainly because of historic reasons. Um, because that was the first thing that people came up with and it just seemed convenient to write this as a column instead of a row, um, which turned out to be confusing later on. So we changed that convention, but we didn't change it for the gradient, unfortunately. Um, so the gradient is basically just an abbreviation of the Jacobi matrix transposed for a real valued function. So if you have a real valued function, then the Jacobi matrix just has one row and one column per variable. Um, and the gradient is simply the transpose. You take the Jacobi matrix, you turn it around, and there you get the gradient. And you just, well, basically we just have that because it's often more convenient to write column vectors in, in that case instead of row vectors. You could also just write Jacobi matrix transpose if you'd rather do that. And basically, um, in many cases, people don't pay attention to that difference a lot. Um, the only thing where you really have to watch out is when you apply chain rule or product rule, because that is when having rows or columns makes a huge difference, yeah? So generally, if you have um, differentials and you somehow combine them using chain rule or product rule, then you just work with differentials and Jacobi matrices. Just don't work with gradients then. Yeah, or convert all your gradients to Jacobi matrices by transposing them beforehand. That's probably the easiest thing to do. So I hope that, that clarifies this relation. Does it? I think so. Okay, Maybe. anything else? Um, and now um, someone asked how one could get to Schwartz theorem concerning the interchangeability of the order of taking partial derivatives. Schwartz's theorem, so that refers, refers to, the, uh, to the Hessian, right? Well, basically it doesn't have to do a lot with what we discussed so far. Um, yeah. So what one thing you could remember here is the Hessian, that's basically the uh, matrix of second partial derivatives. 
Um, and you could say the Hessian, no, let's write that first, of a function, hf of x. Well, that's basically the differential of the gradient, if you want, okay? So the Hessian is the differential of the gradient of f of x. And that means if you have a gradient, then you have one row per variable, and you just take the normal differential of that. Yeah, so basically you take in the Jacobi matrix of the gradient if you want. That's the Hessian. And that doesn't tell you right away whether the mixed derivatives would be interchangeable or not. Um, so the Schwarzschild theorem says this is interchangeable or mixed derivatives are interchangeable if you have a continuously differentiable function. And mostly we'll talk about continuously differentiable functions, um, at least in this case, at least of second degree. We we'll usually assume that the functions we're dealing with are um, continuously differentiable as often as we need them. And normally that's first and second degree and sometimes more. And now there's another question mm -hmm. uh, about um, if you could explain total derivability uh, and the reminder again. Total differentiability and the reminder. Um, just. Okay, so computation of the total derivative is what we just did. Yeah, the total derivative or the differential. Um, that's just this, this df of x that we computed. And basically that's the same thing as a Jacobian of a function, yeah? That's the total derivative. So if it exists, this is equal. Um, and it does always exist um, if uh, the resulting partial derivatives are all continuously differentiable. And that's basically what you need to know in 90% of the cases. Um, the definition of the differential, of the total differential, is a little more complicated. What we did there basically was to say, well, we want a function, do we have a function f? Um, and we want an approximation of that function by a linear function. And this linear function or the, the um, governing parameter of the linear function, that is going to be what we call the differential. And that's an analogy to the one dimensional case. What you want there is, uh, one dimension, so you have, say you have a function that looks somewhat like, uh, like this here. And you want to do an approximation of that function at some point, let's say this, this x here, that's what you want to approximate. Um, an approximate by a linear function, that means by a line. So something that looks like, that looks like this. Well, you want the tangent at that graph, geometrically speaking. That's one dimensional um, differentiation. And the governing parameter of that, um, tangent, of that tangential line here uh, is the slope. The slope is exactly F prime. Yeah, the so slope of that is F prime at X star. Now, if we have uh, more than one variable, we don't really have a slope anymore because then the, there's no tangential line, um, there's a tangential plane or hyperplane then, um, and that has different slopes if you want for different directions. So um, you need to kind of make up a vector that consists of these slopes and that's precisely what the differential does. Um, for the definition, what we do is we say, well, we want this, um, this approximation here through a linear function and the linear function, well, of course, that needs to start with the value at the point X star where we do this approximation. Then there's this parameter, df of X star, that's what we call the differential, times X minus X star. So if we substitute X star for X here, then this expression becomes zero and we just get back our function value. Yeah, so the approximation is the same as the function at x star and outside of x star, it may be a little different, um, but it hopefully is still close as long as we're close to x star. That's the idea. Same thing here. 
So this line, of course, is different from the function if we're far away, like here or here. But as long as we're close to x star, the approximation is pretty good. And that's what this remainder expresses. is. So usually the function is not equal to this approximation. It's just an approximation after all. So we need some remainder term, something that captures the difference. That's this R term here. And um, this difference should be, well, hopefully zero at the point X star itself. Um, and we'd expect it to grow um, if we go get far away from X star, but we'd expect it to be small if we're close to X star. Yeah, so basically that's the condition with R small close to X star. Um, and we just need to formalize this small a little more. Now what we mean by small is precisely if we take in that function value of R of X minus X star, um, and uh, divide it by the difference of X minus X star. Yeah, so the, the uh, amount of closeness of X and X star basically. Um, then the remainder should, should uh, tend to zero quicker than this difference goes to zero. Yeah, that means the limit of this expression as X tends to X star, that should be zero. So meaning close to X star, the remainder goes to zero quicker than X goes to X star. So we have a good approximation as long as we're still close to the point X star. Now what happens outside of that, we don't say anything about that. The differential is just a local definition here, yeah? And then this thing here, again, this parameter here, that is what we call the differential. And again, if all your partial derivatives are continuous, then the differential is the same as the uh, Jacobi matrix um, or the gradient transpose. So computation is usually not an issue. Um, you just need to be sure that this thing actually, actually exists so that the remainder behaves nicely. Okay, I hope that clarifies this question. Um, I think so, there's no further question. And now I just wanted to remind you that you wanted to give an explanation of the direction, uh, directional derivative. Uh, yes, can we hold back on that just two minutes? Because uh, I'd like to, I'd like to add one more thing. <laughs> but thanks a lot. Um, so we've seen an application of chain rule right now. What we have not seen that far is an application of uh, product rule. So I'd like to quickly sketch how that works for this example here. Uh, that, that would be part C, that's not on the sheet. Well, let's do that anyway. So apply product rule to compute the differential of, well, you can compute the differential of the function F times G. Again, G is a function that maps R2 to R3. F is a function that yields a real value. Um, so you could apply product rule to these. Uh, actually, no, you couldn't. My bad. Um, we, have to, we have to modify the example just a little, sorry. I'll explain in a minute why you couldn't. Um, so we take the same G, G of X1, X2. That is again defined as 2x1 plus x2, x1 minus x2, um, and x1. Okay, so this takes uh, two variables as the input. Formally, our f takes three variables as the input. And that means a function like f times g is not very well defined because um, you have to have a common input for that. And well, that 
needs to consist of three variables, but G doesn't take three variables as an input. So that cannot really be a well-defined product. So what we have to do is either make G accept um, a third variable. You can do that, of course. That would be X3 then. Or we define the F a little differently um, and say we, we define an F that only takes two variables as input. Um, and we simplify this a little and say we just have X1 squared e to the x2, uh, we forget about this x3 thing. Yeah, we just set this constant. So now the product is actually defined. Okay, so that means we can now define a function f times g that takes two variables as an input. Um, f times g of x1, x2, that would then be f of x1, x2 times g of x1, x2. So this f here, that's a real number, that g is a vector in R3, and that means our result will again be in R3, f times g. And now you can ask for the derivative of that. So if you want d of f times g of x, you could then apply product rule. And again, that's almost the same as in the one dimensional case with uh, just a little difference here. Um, again, you have to take care of the order of how things are working. And this is unfortunately a little different from the one dimensional case. Um, actually, you could apply the same thing to the one dimensional case. It doesn't make, uh, um, it doesn't really matter there. But for the one-dimensional case, it's usually easier to, to remember that differently. So what you have to do in this product rule is you have to take um, the derivative of f times g, but now the order is reversed. So you take g times df of x. And then you take f of x times dg of x. Okay, so in the one dimensional case, you'd usually start with df times g um, here, and you have to pay attention to that reversed order now. But again, that's basically the only difference. Otherwise, um, it's pretty much the same thing. Okay, and if you now compute df, you already have computed dg, and compute these matrix products then you would get um, the derivative of f times g. Okay, I'll leave that to you as a home study problem, um, but that's how it will work here. Just have to pay attention to the order of the functions in this differentiation form. Um, your mic isn't working. My mic isn't working. It's not very good today, so uh, is it working again? Yeah. Okay, thanks for that. So, okay, so once more, um, mostly the same as in one dimension. Just pay attention to this little difference here. Yeah, so this this is really important. Okay, that much about uh, chain rule and product rule. It's four o'clock already, so um, I guess that should suffice here. And now let's um, take a quick example at uh, a directional derivative as well. So we can do that. Um, which function should we take as an example? Maybe we just take this one here, so example directional derivatives. So I'm just taking uh, the function f from uh, exercise 5.3. I'll write that down once more. So that's a function on three variables um, that yields a real number as an output. And the definition of that function is x1, x2, x3. That is x1 um, times x2 squared times x3. 
And let's say you want the directional derivative of that function. Let's just invent some direction that we want. Let's say one minus one, two, for example. Yeah, it doesn't really matter. The principle is the same. Um, I want to compute dv of f at some point x. So the definition actually would be, um, we, we, uh, we use f restricted to the line. So we take that line through x in the direction of v that would look like this here. Um, we would have lambda in r. And then this is basically a one-dimensional function. If we, if we fix x and v, then we have a one-dimensional function, just the lambda varies. So we were looking at the function f along that line, and we could then just differentiate with respect to lambda, and that's our direction derivative. Um, however, we don't actually have to do that step to compute this direction derivative. As it turns out, things are a lot easier because what you can simply do is you can take this um, this direction v and multiply that with the gradient of f at x. And that would give you the directional derivative in v direction. So basically the gradient is kind of the universal directional derivative that contains the derivatives with respect to the axis. And if you want a different direction, just take the gradient. Um, and you, you um, compute that scalar product here. And that gives you the directional derivative in a different direction then. So in practice, this is not that hard. Let's compute the gradient quickly. So this is, if we differentiate this expression here with respect to x1, then we get x2 squared x3. With respect to x2, that is 2x1, x2, x3. And with respect to x3, that's x1, x2 squared. That's the gradient here. And now if you want dv of f at x, then we just compute one minus one, two, transposed times this gradient here. Just copy that one. x1, x2 squared. So the result would then be x2 squared x3 minus 2x1, x2, x3 plus 2x1, x2 squared. Okay, not much we can simplify here. So let's just let it be like this. Um, so that is a directional derivative um, at the point x in direction b. And of course, whichever direction you want, you can just substitute that here. Then the result will look a little different, um, but uh, the way to compute it is always the same. So with this extra knowledge that you hopefully have by now, um, that shouldn't be difficult anymore. Philip, any more questions? Um, no. Okay, so I guess we'll uh, conclude our central exercise session ah, for it. Yeah. Um, is it uh, um, sufficient to only know this way? Yes, it's sufficient to only know this way. Yeah, of course, it's always good if you can also work with the definition and you should know the definition. Yeah, you should actually know how that, how that is defined, how that would work. But if I'm asking you to compute a direction derivative, then this is the way you would use. That's, in most cases, much easier than the other way. Uh, another question coming in. Um, why do we write um, the vector transposed? Why do we write the vector transpose? Basically, what we do here, uh, you mean this one here, right? Why we transpose here, I guess. So what we do here is um, we compute a scalar product of the vectors v, and gradient of f at x. And the standard scalar product is just one vector transpose times the other vector. I hope that answers that question. 
I think so too. Yeah. There's okay. No. Any more questions? No reaction. Good. Okay. Two more things I'd, I'd like to mention briefly. Um, you are probably aware that next Monday is a public holiday. So there will be a no central exercise session next Monday. Um, you have hopefully seen the videos for this week already, or at least um, had a look at how much I posted. You will have noticed that there has been a lot. Um, I just kind of wanted to round off the topic. Um, so I posted some more videos this week. Um, there'll be a lot less videos next week. Yeah. So if you don't manage to do everything this week, that's fine. Just um, push a little to the next week. That's also okay. Also, as I said, Monday is a public holiday. So Monday would have been a day of lectures. Um, so I'm reducing the workload for next week accordingly. Okay, um, and the second thing I'd, I would like to mention is um, I've added a uh, anonymous poll um, to the Moodle page. So if you have any feedback that you'd like to give, be it positive or negative, or if you have any suggestions that you'd like me to know about, um, then you can also use this. And actually I would, be, uh, I would be grateful if you did give some feedback because that's basically the only way I can know whether this works and how this works and how we can improve. Um, so if you hesitate to give feedback on the chat, because we can know your name there, then there's now an anonymous option as well. And it would be nice if you made use of that. Okay. Um, there's one more thing. Um, I think people got confused because you used another method as last time for this derivatives. For which exactly? For the last, um, so the directional derivatives, I guess. I did. So I think last time I basically used this uh, this definition. Okay, here, because I, the, 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 the question is, um, according to exercise five, uh, 4 4.5, so last week, yes. uh, another method is used. Is it similar to what Dr. Ritter just showed? Ah, okay. So in 4.5, um, I'm asking you to compute directional derivatives. And I think, I don't have the solution at hand right now. I think in the solution um, for the, so there's two subproblems. I think in the first one, I'm using basically the definition to compute uh, the directional derivative. And then a second subproblem, I think I used uh, this, this way here, that I just presented. Uh, both will lead to the same results. So you can use whatever you like best and computationally, the easier one is probably this one. Yeah, if you, if you try that for 4.5, that should get you the same results as the more complicated method. I hope that clears up the confusion. Anything else, Philip? Um, yeah, one more thing in the last step. Can I then write one minus one, two instead of the column vector transposed? So what you mean is you can, of course, you can, of course, write it like this as a row vector, yeah? So that's, of course, the same thing. Just write this down. Yeah, so you can write it in this way as well. Yeah, instead of a column vector transposed, you can also write the row vector directly. Again, that's mostly a matter of taste and maybe of space that you have on the paper. Uh, and the last question, what is the difference between dif deriv differential and derivative? Uh, I'm using those interchangeably. So the differential and the derivative uh, for what I'm concerned is the same thing. Mostly uh, I'm using the term derivative for the partial derivatives, whereas I'm using the term differential for the total differential, so the gradient, the Jacobi matrix, um, any larger entity made up of partial derivatives, um, but they can actually be used interchangeably. Then that's all. Okay, great. So thanks a lot for participating um, and thanks a lot, Philip, for moderating the chat. Um, I'll see you on Thursday in the tutorials. And of course, next week, there'll also be tutorials. So if you have any questions next week, then please just take those to the tutorials um, instead of the central exercise session. And there'll be another central exercise session in two weeks. Okay, thanks a lot and goodbye.